the governmental response thus far in the in the first you know three or four days since the uh, since the hurricane hit has been crickets. You know, just not a whole lot of nothing. Welcome to the Reformed Reckoner on Eschatology Matters, part of the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network, and now available on Boniface Media. Want to start reading the Puritans but don't know where to begin? Puritan treasures for today from Reformation heritage books make the riches of these godly writers of old accessible for the modern reader. With updated language and helpful introductions, these classic works from John Owen, Jeremiah Burroughs, and more are the perfect starting point for the curious reader. Learn more about the Puritan Treasures for today at heritagebooks.org slash Puritan Treasures. Enter promo code EMATTERS for 10% off the whole order. This episode of the Reform Reckoner, we have a special guest, Corey Wing. He's the host of Civically Minded, a podcast that focuses on civics, ecclesiology, and family. And he's also an elder and pastoral intern at his local PCA church. Thanks for having you on. Oh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me on, Johnny. So this week, I want to kind of focus our episode on one concept uh, that we saw come up in three different kind of news stories. That concept is around ordered loves. That is how we as Christians need to think about all the relationships we have um, all over the place, whether it's in our church or in our families, in our neighborhoods, communities, and even at large here on the globe. How do we need to order them? How do we need to prefer people? And what that means for practical Christian living. If you've been paying attention on Twitter and X, you probably heard about a little bit of this uh, fight that kind of happened online in a conversation debate. Uh, it really got started um, through the Crisis King conference that the Ogden guys um, put on when Jeff Durbin from Apologia pulled out from that. James White in the tweet describes the situation saying, let's start with some basic facts. When he was asked to speak there, there was nothing about debating doing panel discussions on natural law or theonomy or anything else. Just assumed it would be a get together to respond to the general degradation of our culture and providing a Christian response there too. Something he does regularly, especially as he travels the country speaking for end abortion now. There isn't almost anyone with more experience in testifying before governmental bodies about the need to provide equal protection than Jeff. He later says, next, I really do not want to have to go back over all the stuff that has been said and posted by Stephen Wolf over the past year or more, inclusive of his mockery of sacralism, his identifying just within the past month, the sober words of Phil Johnson as, quote, anti-intellectualism and, quote, moronic, and all the rest of the rather constant sniping and commentary that one will find on his public posts. I briefly note that he has taken to doing the same kind of dismissive sniping at Dr. Joe Boot of the Ezra Institute, of which I am a fellow. And I likewise provide the contextual comment that both Dr. Boot and I spoke at Joel's conference last year. We all know that he is opposed to the necessity of the fulfillment of the post-millennial hope for there to be anything even remotely like, quote, Christian nationalism, hence putting us all on a very different basis for our responses to, quote, trash world. Apologia Church's elders, inclusive of Jeff and myself, do not hold to a Thomistic, natural law, sacral perspective and find such a position utterly untenable. But it was not just these differences that were concerning. It was Stephen Wolf's public statements concerning me and my work that prompted Jeff's reconsideration of his participation. And may I note, given Jeff's current family situation, two newly adopted premature baby girls, committing to almost any traveling and speaking outside of end abortion now is a real challenge for him and for our fellowship. So in light of all of this, uh, there's clearly some tension between the kind of Christian groups out in America who are pushing against uh, clown world, trash world here. But the issue is there seems to be a distinction around how do you think through bringing in natural relations and natural law into this conversation. It really comes to a boiling point last week when Stephen Wolf tweeted this, Christianity as the true religion, affirming what is true, good, and beautiful, command you to love all, but to prefer your people over other people's. This tweet uh, led to a lot of different responses. Some people are suggesting that Stephen Wolf is promoting white ethnocentrism or even um, neo-Nazi kind of conversation talking points, giving a nod there, um, which I think is unfair, but it did cause a lot of people to have questions. What does he mean by your people? And how should we think about the natural relations that we have with others, perhaps as opposed to the spiritual relations? Corey, any thoughts on that? I do, actually. I, I love that you've kind of 
got us thinking about what you what you said earlier, which is a really powerful comment about rightly ordered loves. And I can't help but think as you've been kind of, and of course I've read these tweets myself, but as I'm kind of re-listening to someone else read them, it, it lets me hear them from a third point perspective. And it makes me think that our rightly ordered loves almost have a lot to do with what I have historically called rightly ordered fears, you know, and, and let me explain and unpack that just for a second. Our loves, of course, as men much smarter than me, Dr. White and, and uh, Dr. Wolf and, and all these guys with, with a lot of letters in front and behind their names, which I don't have, talk about the loves issue a lot. And, and I think, though, that that gets to what uh, just a basic biblicist view would say is rightly ordered fears. You know, that, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But when we fear man, and I think a lot of this conversation goes down to, well, I don't want to come across as hateful, or I don't want to come across as an ethnocentrist or a racist or a neo-Nazi or, or on the other side, there, there's a ton of fear on coming across woke or some kind of compromise on a, a very more leftist agenda. So I think that there's a fear factor that goes into both of these as well. So everyone is couching and guarding what they say and trying to make sure that their personal camp uh, doesn't throw them under the bus, you know, whether that's in in some of these guys' cases, uh, a more Ogden-centered group or apology, of course, being there in Arizona and the Phoenix area. And and of coming, you, you mentioned earlier, I'm from the PCA. We have been going through this all year. When we had our General Assembly back in June, originally David French had been invited and then we disinvited him. And again, and, and I saw the camps within my own denomination start to really form. And so this is something that I've watched happen on X, but I've actually seen happen and been part of. I mean, I, I took a big part in what was going on back in June at the GA um, as much as an elder in the in the PCA can. And so I've I've seen this happen both in the real world and I've watched it happen now on X. And, and it's, a, it's a pretty volatile situation for sure. Yeah. And I think people, when it comes to this conversation, uh, I, I read Stephen Wolf's uh, tweet and thought it wasn't anything too shocking, the idea of preferring our own people. Now, the thing is, you got to define what it means by our own people. So Dr. Joseph Boot responds to his tweet saying this, lies that sound true are always more dangerous. Jesus doesn't call us to follow the Greek conception of the true, good, and beautiful. He requires obedience to the law of God, which includes loving one's enemies. My people are God's covenant people from every tribe nation, and tongue, Matthew 12, 48 through 50. There is a difference between acknowledging the particular fam familial and civic responsibility I have toward my own immediate family and nation and, quote, preferring some people over others. The overtones of this are obvious. And frankly, it wasn't Hispanics who brought abortion to America or Blacks who brought cultural Marxism or Asians who brought LGBTQ ideology or North American Indians who brought euthanasia or Arabs who brought the climate cult. I'm pretty sure it was, quote, our people on all accounts. Let's put our own house in order. So it's interesting to hear such heightened language in response to this. And I think this to me is partially why this conversation is so difficult to have, that when you present the idea of that natural relations, as well as spiritual relations, have this intermingling relationship with one another, where I should prefer my wife towards all other women, my daughter over all other daughters. Um, we all understand that, um, but then it gets to the question of how do we apply that to our own country? How do I apply that to uh, my specific area? I'm in Orange County, California, right? Uh, and do I apply that to those people? Well, what about a Christian who is in a town of, across the um, whole nation from me, as opposed to an atheist who's my next door neighbor? And this to me really gets to a conversation that, at least from my perspective, has been helped through uh, Stephen Wolf's uh, book, A Case for Christian Nationalism. That makes a distinction between benevolence, which is the love I should have for all people, and beneficence, which is the actual doing of love that I'm limited by, you know, space and time. So as it looks, as we hear the parable of the Good Samaritan, there is wisdom that my neighbor is the one who's in front of me, right? And therefore, it's the one near me, physically present um, with me, who is my people. And so I think it's this nuanced conversation that needs to have. And Eric Kahn, responding to Joe Booth, um, says this, Joe, respectfully, I think a lot of this is talking past each other and being unnecessarily divisive. 
I would love to have you sit down with Stephen and hash some of this out as Christian brothers. At New Christendom would be more than willing to facilitate a charitable debate. Corey, as we get back into this conversation and the idea of a debate, which Apologia James White has seemed to dismiss as not being a possibility, um, do you see what I'm seeing? The kind of talking past each other where Stephen Wolf says something, which certainly could be misinterpreted to say neo-Nazi statements, but to me it's just a basic understanding that we are to love where God has placed us. Am I missing something? Do you see something different? No, actually, I I would agree with you wholeheartedly. I, I think that there's something very overcomplicated about a hyperized spiritual view of, of this, what is really a simplistic teaching, and even non-Christians uh, the world over. And I've, I've had the benefit of traveling quite a bit uh, in my life and going to some other countries and places where the Chris, that, that Christianity is not the um, driving thrust of their culture or of their people. And they understand that that it is their own neighbors, and, and they mean that by literal neighbors, their own kin. I spent some time in Asia where filial piety and and love of one's own kin and family, and even three or four generations oftentimes will live in the same home. And they understand that that is naturally how the world is set up. And so when I think about politics, and as you said earlier on my channel, I talk about politics and civics a lot. I don't expect when when the Brits went to vote uh, just a few months ago, and it was a very volatile vote there in England, I didn't expect them to think about how we across the pond thought about it. I, they needed to go to the polls and they needed to vote for who the best candidate for England is going to be. And so do the Germans and so do the South Koreans. And so that's that's a very standard thing. I think we in America, because of our own cultural and historical baggage, oftentimes get um, bludgeoned into thinking that we have to be not only the world's police, which is a job we've held for far too long, but we need to be the world's, you know, caregiver as well. So, so we oftentimes look and say, well, but the whole world is our neighbor as Americans, because we're a nation of immigrants and we're, you know, this obtuse thought and not even a nation. Well, no, we are an actual nation with real borders and a real culture and real people. And so we have to, uh, think about those people um, and, and what is best for them. And like you said, a microcosm of that would be for you, Orange County, and for me, and, you know, the, the part of the nation where I live and the community that I serve in. Yeah, definitely. And I think that ties in really well to our next story about uh, some big mid-Eva um, celebrity pastors who are now endorsing Kamala. But before I move on to that, I do want to kind of tie, at least hopefully at least right now, into a little bit of a bow, the conversation between Eric Kahn and the Ogden boys, as well as James White and Apologia Group, where after all of this conversation, there's a lot of heat, a lot of excitement, which again, theologically minded people, we should be passionate, but we should be able to unite over our common faith. And you saw that happen. James White posted this tweet. I'm sure this would disappoint many, but Eric Kahn and I spent about 80 minutes on the phone this afternoon, and it was an enjoyable and helpful time. Of course, I was using my new hearing aids to both hear and talk, which made me the boomer side of the conversation. In fact, if I understood him correctly, he's pretty much the same age as my son, which makes me even more the boomer side of this conversation. To which Eric Kahn responds, saying, very much enjoyed talking with James White and appreciate his long faithful ministry. We, of course, have disagreements, but I count him a faithful brother. There's much wisdom to glean from our fathers in the faith. It's always good when brothers are able to dwell together in unity, uh, but we don't always see that happening in the evangelical world. Um, just earlier this week, we saw a thread post, so not a tweet, but a thread post from Ray Orton, where he said, never Trump, this time Harris, always Jesus, to which our PCA friend David French said, this is the way. Corey, did you see that? What are your thoughts on it? I did see that. And um, yeah, David French, uh, who, <laughs> and who, who has by the way, left the PCA and kicking us the whole time he was leaving, telling us, again, much like our first conversation, saying one of the big reasons he left the PCA, him and his wife, uh, felt the PCA was full of what they called, quote, neo-Confederates, uh, end quote, which is odd because that's the same language that J.D. Vance and, or pardon me, J.D. Vance, J.D. Greer um, and a, a few others used to describe the SPC just a, a mere year or two ago. So it's all these... Uh, leftist talking points do indeed get passed around, it seems. But no, I saw the tweet and 
Um, I actually commented on X to something that Michael Foster said. He was saying that, you know, it was, it was a very clear thing what Ray said. Um, and I agree, you know, my, my, uh, my oldest is eight years old. She's in third grade. And just last week, uh, she brought home her English homework and her English and grammar homework was starting to learn the difference between an exclamatory sentence, uh, you know, an, um, a, a declarative sentence and an interrogative sentence. And, you know, those three statements you just read that Ray Ortland put on, on this thread were declarative statements, three word or two word declarative statements. These aren't difficult statements to interpret. You don't need a hermeneutics degree mm -hmm. to understand a, a three word sentence of never Trump, you know, or, or this time Harris or always Jesus. I mean, the, these are very simple um, declarative statements that he made. And even my third grade eight-year-old daughter, I think, could parse out his meaning. And it's and it's nerve-wracking um, in some sense. Um, at this point, it shouldn't be. But I think if you look over 10, 20 years about where a lot of our leadership in the evangelical world has gone, um, really turn its back against Christians, it feels like, in a very true way. Um, saying that you're never Trump and this time Harris. And then with the last statement, Kind of implying this is the undergirding reason why he's against Trump and for Harris is that he's always Jesus. It really betrays, I think, the Christian impulse when it comes to politics and these rightly ordered loves. You know, right now, the biggest talking points, as I see in politics, seems to be uh, three points. Um, it seems to be abortion being a big talking point, um, immigration and economics. And all three of those points, if you're looking at the one that allows for more, most Christian type of activity, Trump certainly will be more pro towards the type of activities Christians would like to bring about than Harris. And to go for Harris seems to be almost a uh, giving away of your own people as a Christian. And I, and I think that's why I want to bring this kind of story into the conversation in this episode is when we talk about rightly ordered loves, yes, we could debate on the fringe and on these topics. And I think always theological conversations and debates are always helpful, but we have to, again, almost rightly order our theological debates. There's a bigger problem with rightly ordered loves in America that needs to be addressed, and that is people seem to not care about their Christian and American neighbors, or even just American neighbors, which our last story talks about. Hurricane Helene has done devastation through Southeast America, um, really destroying so much land, so much property, and sadly, we have news about over 100 confirmed deaths from this storm. Right now, there's a press um, conference from the White House that stated today, or at least of this recording, over 600 additional people are missing and not been contacted. Um, obviously, Corey, this hits you more directly than it hits me. Um, love to kind of get your insights on the, the impact of the storm and really the response from the federal government seeming to suggest that their loves aren't rightly ordered. Yeah, uh, hey, when you say that it, that it hits me a little more than um, than you, it, it, the only reason is I live just north of Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, and uh, actually this morning when you guys uh, called me to invite me on this episode, I was actually on my way to what we call the High Country. So the North Carolina Mountains, for those of you who aren't from this part of the part of the country, the North Carolina Mountains are really kind of um, broke up into two main areas. You have what we call Western North Carolina, which is Asheville and that area. And it got devastated, absolutely devastated by this hurricane. And then you have what we call the high country, which is more close to Boone. Um, and they're about two hours apart. So, so you say North Carolina mountains, and those are the two most well-known cities in the North Carolina mountains. Um, but they're about two hours apart from each other. They're, you know, roughly 90 miles. So uh, there, there's a pretty healthy distance between the two of them. And so I was heading up toward Boone just earlier today, and I ended up talking to um, a friend of mine that I've got up there, and they said, man, you might as well turn around and go home. You can't. So most of the roads are still impassable. There's down power lines and down power poles everywhere, and uh, you're just not going to be able to make it fully up the mountain. So uh, you're wasting a trip. So I, I did. I turned around, and I came home. But the fact of the matter remains, uh, lots of churches, lots of businesses, tons of homes, um, Black Mountain, North Carolina, and Chimney Rock, North Carolina, are gone. They're just gone. They, they, between mudslides and the water, those townships have been completely eradicated off the map. They don't exist. So if you look at before and after uh, shots that you can find on you know Google and other places, 
Uh, the, I, when I say that those towns are gone, I really do mean it. They don't exist any longer. So, so the, the unbelievable devastation has been the worst we've ever seen in this area. And the lack of response has also been deafening. Uh, I had, I've got family in Indiana and my uncle called me just this afternoon and said, Hey, are you guys okay? We keep seeing little snippets on the news about there's this really bad storm that hit North Carolina, but they only briefly mention it. And then they go to the next story. And he's like, so we just thought we'd call and make sure you guys are okay. And so it really gave me a chance to kind of tell him how bad things were. And he said, wow, they're not talking about this here. And um, that's the, when I've talked to friends from other parts of the country, that's been what I've been seeing kind of repeated over and over again. So I don't know why we've hit a media black hole, but we seem to have here in Appalachia. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I don't think it'd be surprised to a lot of people to think that when a storm hits um, and really, I think this might be one of the more, the, the most destructive storm we've seen since Katrina. And when a storm like this hits, that's so bad, you, you can't help but compare it to the response to Katrina. Now, certainly as a general principle, it seems the federal government is not the best in terms of logistics and ordering, right? This is why we often think, see the wisdom of limited government. But even with Katrina, you saw the media push for support of that situation. I remember famously um, this video, this uh, almost like an infomercial of all these celebrities coming on saying, we need your help, we need your help. Kanye West obviously famously disrupts that live airing. But there is all this push um, for um, help during Katrina. And it doesn't seem the same type of impetus is happening behind um, Hurricane Helene. Um, and as we're talking kind of even before this episode, it seems like there are different um, kind of math that's happening almost politically that determines how um, much help and support and how much fervor and zeal happens on the media to support um, places down like New Orleans versus, you know, white Appalachia. And then even it comes to other countries. Um, Corey, you want to give a little bit more insights onto that? Absolutely. So, so I just, you know, we were talking, like you said, offline and, and because my channel deals so much with politics, I keep up with that a lot. And it's just something in my wheelhouse. And when you look at just last week in the last seven days, we've given another $8 billion to the Ukraine, another $8 billion to, uh, to, to Israel as well. And now here we've got tens of thousands, if not, you know, hundreds of thousands of Americans, uh, that have lost everything. And, you know, many that don't have power, um, I know that my neighbor that I talked to earlier today, um, who who kind of kept me from going all the way up to the mountains, he said that power might not be restored to some areas for another 10 days to two weeks is what they're hearing. Again, maybe that will get better because they are sending crews from other states, and thank God for that. But you said something that I think is, is really helpful. Uh, you talked about how the government just naturally isn't good at this. And, you know, when you get a behemoth the size of the federal government, making the movements necessary to, 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 you know, get that giant wheel in motion is very, very complicated. So I try to be as understanding as possible that, that the, uh, you know, mechanisms are difficult and that, and that smaller groups, you know, whether it's um, uh, uh, local groups or charitable groups through churches, or even, you know, non-church organizations that help out the uh, United Way, things like that, they are a little more mobile. They're a little more agile and, and they're, they're needed and helpful at the t times like these, but it does seem like the the governmental response thus far in the in the first you know three or four days since the uh, since the hurricane hit has been crickets, you know, just not a whole lot of nothing. And um, entire, like I said, entire portions of our state, and I know Tennessee, Georgia, and Florida are just devastated. To to give you the, again the magnitude of this. There is a stretch, uh, I think it's about a, a, a 20 foot or 30 foot stretch of I-40. So this is an, you know, a, a national interstate system. Uh, it's, the, it's the main thoroughfare that connects like Knoxville to Charlotte. And the eastbound lane, if you were coming from Knoxville to Charlotte, there's about a 30 foot section that is gone. You know, it just got swept away in, in, the, in the rising tide. And uh, that's really remarkable when you think about it, that an entire section of one of the U.S. interstates is just gone, you know, and and I don't know how long something like that takes to rebuild, but um, my brother and his family that live in Knoxville uh, might not be coming for the holidays this year. Yeah, it's a truly um, horrible what this hurricane has done. And obviously, we want to be praying for those families um, who've lost 
lost loved ones, those 600 that are still missing and thousands more who are without kind of basic necessities. Uh, there's a lot of ways to get involved. Um, it sounds like local um, groups are probably the best way to go about that. Uh, we might link something in the description that can point you in the right direction there. But as Christians, right, this is the importance of loving our neighbor, right? Um, we could try to overly spiritualize this and say the only love we should have for our neighbor is evangelism and prayer, which are good, necessary, and kind of really key activities of the Christian. But so is taking care of their physical well-being. And as God has placed us in this nation, we should care for this nation. We should care for the people um, that God has given us. So thanks, Corey, for joining us on this episode. Um, before you go, let the people know where they could find you. Uh, you can find me at civicallyminded.com. Uh, uh, I actually own that website. So www.civicallyminded.com that can link you to my YouTube, my Instagram, or my X account. Um, I, all of it is branded the same, civically minded. So if you're on Instagram, YouTube, or X, you can find me there. It is C-I-V-E-C-C, -C, so Civics Ecclesiology Family, C-I-V-E-C-C-L-Y-minded.com. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Corey. Well, thanks for tuning in to the Reform Reckoner. As we say, be steadfast and movable and always abound in the work of the Lord. We'll see you next week. Seated here at my right hand.